The Charlotte Podcast Festival is presented by Blumenthal Performing Arts, the Queen City Podcast Network, Eclex Creative Agency, and WFAE, Charlotte's NPR news source. The home of acclaimed podcast, Charlotte Talks, She Sets, The List, Amplifier, Southbound, and FAQ City. Learn more about WFAE and our latest podcast, Work It, at WFAE.org. Welcome to the podcast festival. My name is Tiffany Bryant Jackson. I'll be your moderator for today. You are in your, I was like, which, which one are we in? Um, you are in day three of the podcast festival on this Wednesday and we're from scripts to screens with audio drama today. So if this is where you're supposed to be, you're here. If you weren't supposed to be here, you're here. So don't go anywhere and hang out because we've got some really great things to say. Just a few housekeeping things before we start. I do wanna let you know that this session is being recorded and you will get a copy of this recording sent to your email during this month. So if you have to jump away for something and come back, you will not miss anything because it'll be recorded for you to keep forever. And if you just love our podcast guys and you're like, wait, I need to go back and remember what they said, you'll have access to that information. It's not going anywhere. So this podcast festival is brought to you or presented by a few organizations we want to make sure we mention. First is WFAE, then Queen City Podcast Network, Lumenthal Performing Arts, and Eclex Creative Agency. These guys have partnered to bring you a month-long experience. And I'm not just saying this as your moderator, but I am hype as a person. There is lots of information flowing through this month just for you to learn. If you haven't started a podcast yet, this is where you learn. If you've got one and you need a little more information, this is where you gather it. So this is pretty exciting. So why are we here tonight? So we're here to learn a little bit more about audio drama. And I am not the person to tell you these things. So I'm going to introduce you to the two fellas handling tonight's conversation that will feed you all the information you need tonight. So again, just double checking where you're supposed to be. You're in from scripts to screen with audio dramas. We have Kevin Patterson of Detective Samuel Sift's Loved Ones Discovery or Recovery Services and Morgan Givens of Flyest Fables. We've got a couple of questions for them to ask. I'll ask a few, but please, if you have questions, put that in the chat. We'll be, we'll be taking your questions in tonight. There may be some things that they will say that will answer what you've been thinking about, but do not be afraid to um, ask us in the chat and we'll make sure we get some answers to you. So, gentlemen, are you ready? Fantastic. So I would love it if each of you takes a moment, just introduce yourselves to everyone so we get to know you a little better. Yeah, we can go. I was just say, Morgan, do you want to go? Oh, uh, sure. All right, then. I'll take it. Uh, so my name is Morgan Givens. I am a writer, a storyteller, and an audio producer. I currently live in Washington, D.C., but I am originally born and raised in Charlotte, North Carolina. So this is a real treat to be here with y'all tonight. Um, and I have a podcast called Flyers Fables. And it is a fictional podcast that is a set of hope punk fables um, for our current century that, you know, has young Black kids as the heroes of their own stories and fables. It's got magic. It's got songs. Um, and it's just uh, a piece of my heart. So, yeah, that's who I am. And I appreciate uh, y'all having me. I am Kevin Patterson, and I'm the writer and producer for Samuel Sift, Post-Apocalypse Detective. Uh, we, it's our second season's about to premiere on October 31st, which seems appropriate for a zombie noir. Um, we changed the title because it's, it's like everybody could never wrap their braid around it. So that's the new names. Um, and there you go. That's me. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys because... I had this question, and I'm sure some other people have this question, but could you put in your words what an audio drama is? You first, Morgan. Sure. Um, yo, so an audio drama, you know, that the simplest, most pure form of it is fictional audio, um, or it's audio that is fictionalized in some way. And so um, I would say docudramas are this. Um, we have 
a list of audio fiction. There's Valen's Pod. Gimlet has started putting out audio fiction. So it's anything that you kind of create uh, with audio that is not factual. Uh, so which is part of the reason maybe you don't hear it all the time, but that's the like easiest way I could probably put it. Yeah, I would agree with all that. I tell when folks have no idea, I'm like, it's a radio play on iTunes. Um, and there you go. But it's or a, it's a film without any visuals. So because it's all audio, as Morgan just said, um, your writing and your dialogue really matters. Yeah, I um, I kind of think about them as audio movies. Um, that's how, that's what I want people to feel when they listen to the work I create. I want them to have that feeling of lying on their couch, you know, and like those moments you close your eyes and you still know what's happening in the movie because you can just hear all the cues. That's what I try to recreate uh, in audio. I want people to be able to imagine it as viscerally as if they kind of saw it on the screen. I love it. So storytelling at its best without you having to visually see it. I love that. Someone else also loves the fact that you said audio movies. So seeing as though this is not a genre that's everywhere right now. So when we think of podcasts, it's not the first thing we immediately think of. Tell us what made you get into that drama. Like what attracted you? Uh, I think any writer of dialogue, whether it's theater, sketch, film, television, um, unless you're already made it in Hollywood or something, it's hard to get things that you've written produced. Um, I think a lot of writers end up being directors because you have to produce your own stuff, uh, which I've done for long short films and things. And so I kind of was aware of audio dramas. I was like, you know what, that, you know, originally I was like, yeah, hey, that sounds a lot easier than a movie. Uh, which it is, it's still a lot of work, which I'm sure we'll cover, uh, and takes a long time. Um, but I got into that, but since I've been in it, I, I really have almost enjoy writing for, uh, audio than, than film now. Um, so that was why I got into the audio drama subcategory. Morgan? Uh, yeah, I, I got into it, um, mainly this, at least this, uh, show that I'm currently wrapped into was because of my nephew. Uh, he is currently four and a half. He turns five in January. But at the time I created the show, I couldn't find any type of audio that spoke directly to young Black kids, um, that just painted them as kids going through life where magic could possibly happen, but uh, actually digging into the complexities and nuances of being a young Black person in the U.S. And so, you know, because I was unable to find it, I decided that what I wanted to do was instead create the world um, in some way that I would like my nephew to grow into. Uh, and so I, I just kind of fell into audio fiction um, naturally in that way, but I've also kind of been a storyteller on stage. And the cool thing, you know, about audio, and one thing I noticed when I used to tell stories on stage was the way that people would really lean in when you had the right words. And so I think I recognized the power and the danger in that, but I was like, you can also reach more people with audio. Um, and so, yeah, I just decided that the art I wanted to create, I couldn't go through the regular channels um, and I got sick of hearing no. And so I just told myself, yes. And that's kind of how I ended up in audio. Uh, audio I love that, where you got tired of hearing no, and so you gave yourself a yes. Listen, that's not even a podcast, Jim. <laughs> Y'all write that down. Sometimes you get tired of hearing no, so you got to make your own yes. I'm putting that in my Oprah said books, but I'm going to attribute mm. it to you, Morgan, it, but it's going to be in my Oprah book. All right, so we know that the creation of an audio drama comes in many pieces, right? It's not just, I wrote some words and I'm going to go record it somewhere. Um, I would like each of you to take your time and walk us through your personal process from start to finish, the moment you come up with an idea to getting it recorded and done. Walk us through that and tell us what that's like. Um, audience, if you guys got some questions during that, we will make sure we get to you. Oh, real quick before that, we got a question. Oh, I think it'll go along. So when you're talking about that, someone is asking how much of your scripting process is focused on sound effects and soundscapes, and how much of that do you leave um, to an audio producer to detail out? So I'd love for you each to work that into your your story of start to finish process. Morgan, you go first. I'm going to take care of this light because I'm getting blasted here. All right. Okay. Um, so my process generally begins when 
I sit down and I, I find myself bothered by something or annoyed by something. Um, and I want to kind of dig into the why of that a little more. And so my stories often revolve around themes that I'm kind of struggling to understand in the everyday world um, and that I could see my nephew or young Black kids also grappling with um, in a way that exists because of who they are, but also outside of the context of just being Black in the U.S. Um, and so my ideas kind of come at the same time. And so what happens is I figure out what I want to say first. Like, why am I making this? What is the purpose of this? And this isn't to say that art for art's sake should not exist, but I often find myself drawn to art that seems to have a message, even if it's one I don't uh, quite, I'm not quite able to pick apart or that I may not agree with, but you can tell there was a driven purpose behind it. Uh, and so I, I'm like, what is the purpose of this? What am I trying to say? Um, what am I trying to create of the world and about the world um, when I'm, I'm writing? And so you know, once I understand my message and the purpose behind it and what I want to do, uh, then that's when I kind of sit down and start writing. Um, and as I'm writing, you know, speaking of sound design and soundscapes, writing for audio is very different from writing, um, you know, for a novel. And I don't say very different to like, be like, you can, it's really hard. I mean, it's hard, but it is a skill that can be picked up very, very easily. And what one thing I do that helps is as I'm writing, sometimes I'll read aloud when I'm writing because it is audio. And so you're looking for that rhythm of your voice because we all kind of have a pattern of speaking. And so I try to write to my natural cadence. Uh, and so when people want to write, I'm like, you should write to your cadence because that's how you harmonize between the words, the flow of the words, the music that you bring in to match certain emotions or moods, uh, and the sound effects that you use. And what I like to do with my sound effects is sometimes I like to describe things in almost a magical realist way because that's what my audio fiction is because I want people to picture what I am describing. But sometimes I'll use the sound as the background for the words I don't want to waste, if that makes sense, because you only have so much time, you know, that people are going to be willing to give you until they get invested in your show. And so I can save words. I can create a more coherent picture and a deeper picture if I use sound in place of words and I really allow the emotion and the dialogue of that scene to really take over. And then that way people listening, they will picture the world I have painted. They'll picture the world I have in my head, but they're also seeing the two individuals or whoever these individuals are in this conversation or existing within the construct of the world um, that I make. And so, that's, that's kind of how I start. I start by thinking of what I want to say. I start of thinking also of, am I the person who should be saying this? <laughs> Is this someone else who could tell this better? Um, and I just, you know, I, I try to also come from a place of vulnerability um, because I believe that is what my art is um, good for. It's for myself and others. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that, I know it's a lot at once, but my ideas team to tend to come all at one time. And then it's about me streamlining them so others can follow. And so I'll record, I'll mix, I'll edit, and I'll go back and listen and kind of do it all over again. Um, for the writing for me, uh, I will say that everybody, you should listen to Morgan's first because his is more uplifting than mine. Mine's a comedy set in a zombie noir, uh, so it's, you know, tongue-in-cheek. And My motivation was to basically make people laugh, um, which I enjoy. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised that Morgan starts with a, a strong purpose. Uh, it really comes through in your work, and it's great. Um, for me, I think for writing... Uh, this second season, it took about a year to write 10 episodes. Uh, it's like 109 pages just to kind of give people perspective. Morgan uh, referred to this. I would strongly recommend that you, in the writing process, you have it read live by other people, um, whether that's your friends at a table read, uh, or if you can, if you're lucky enough, if we ever open again, uh, to have even just actors on a stage reading a script with 20, 30 people. Uh, Charlotte is very lucky that we have a, a, a script writers group that meets once a month. They're not right now because of the world we're in. That's run by a woman named Kima Mingo. If you just went on Meetup and looked for script writing Charlotte, um, and I had mine read there. 
My point being in the writing process, definitely have it read out loud and have time built in that you can edit and write and maybe even do a rewrite after doing it live. Cause you're definitely going to, like Morgan said, it's not a novel, it's to be heard. So when you hear it, you're going to notice things that you didn't hear when you were just on the page. Uh, one big one for us was we were lucky enough to do it live on stage before our first season. And I had written so much stuff that the cadence was just weird for people. It just didn't flow. Um, so I think in the writing, I would realize that a live performance and the feedback you get from that, or just a live table read is super, super important for the writing. And then I guess the next step is recording. You want to talk any more about writing before we move on to recording, Morgan or Tiffany? We have one question I'm going to ask you guys from the audience um, that kind of has to do with the writing portion, and then we can we can move on. So um, Stephanie wants to know what the difference is between um, writing an audiobook or an audiobook and an audio drama. Are they one and the same, or do they overlap? So, Morgan, you mind if I start on this one because I wanted to say go for it, yeah. The uh, for the sound effects question, where do I where do you write that in? I definitely write that in. I try to write sound effects in, and my audio engineer, who's given a talk in a week or two, I think, with Morgan, um, I give him a copy of the script, and he's allowed to say, "Hey, put this in a different place. Let's add some instruments here." Like he gets an edit on, and so we're trying to build it. We definitely got from the first season that scenes where there's intentional background sound, whether it's a bar. This season, we got a hydroelectric dam. Just are more engaging than two people in a silent room. So if you can write your scenes in places, there's city noise or whatever, that's, and, and Morgan already said, that's really going to help the audience get involved and, and be able to uh, visualize what's going on. So I definitely write sound early on in the process. Um, for audiobook and audio drama, audiobook is usually someone just sort of reading it. Audio drama is actors speaking it or acting it out, but there are definitely ones out there that are sort of blending those two together and might lean heavy on audiobook with individual scenes or are acted out. And there's just anything in between. So this is all new. You can do whatever you want. Um, what do you think, Morgan? Oh yeah, no. I mean, there's there's not the the main difference I would say between the audiobook straight audiobook as we know it is the development of sound behind it, um, the use of voice acting, uh, as Kevin just kind of mentioned, um, the creation of a world within the audio as opposed to just straight narration. Uh, although in audio dramas we're seeing all kinds of combinations, and so I kind of hesitate to even put a label on what an audio drama is because I don't want to constrain folks' imaginations about what they could possibly create. So it's anything that's not real and it's audio, I guess, but yeah. Love it. Um, so I'm reading the questions. Also, Nick, I'm going to come to that in a little bit. So I'm not skipping your question, Nick, but I'm going to, I will not forget that question. Do know that. Um, I want to stick with our process for a moment here. So as you've got it written down, you've got your words, you set them to yourself or you put them on paper, what's next? Yeah, um, the next is to find a way to record it. And I know um, there's a lot of folks who will be like, your sound has to be absolutely perfect. Uh, but what I have found is the content of what you're creating matters more um, in a lot of cases in your sound. That's not to discount the quality of sound, um, but you can go to some of the top charts and you'll see shows trending there who sound great, but are very kind of light when it comes to substance. Um, so yeah, so once I do that, I sit down and I go and I record. So I am the only voice in my show, uh, which means that I often have to record as the voice within my show uh, and if I'm doing music, which I do myself, and I sing and I layer it, I have to play back my own voice and kind of sing along with it. But in just general audio dramas, once you go and record it, record with whatever you have. 
you know, like if you got an iPhone, if you got some kind of smartphone, if you're just recording into the mic on your computer, just start where you can start and make what you can make with what you have. Um, I don't want to intimidate y'all and, and make you think you have to have an entire production. Some shows you, you need that. Some shows you want that because of what the show is covering. Sometimes if it's just you and you need to get started, I just record and then I sit down and I listen through to my recording, <clears throat> excuse me, and I pay attention to my own pacing. And so that's when I might use that time to break up my own dialogue and pace it differently than when I was voice acting it myself, because then I'm kind of able to get it more natural than what I might have been able to get when it was just me in the booth. Um, as I'm recording, one of the things I do is I listen with my eyes closed. I don't mix and edit with my eyes open because your eyes will fool you when you're mixing dialogue and you'll think you should place your sound clips right, right next to each other, but it might be if you closed your eyes, you would give it a pause and it would sound more natural. So when I'm doing dialogue, I also close my eyes and I put the space bar, I stop my marker as I'm mixing where I think that natural pause would be. Um, so when you're mixing your show, try to actually use what the way that you would hear it. Don't pay as much attention to how it looks as you're mixing it. You, you re really need to care about how it sounds. Um, and then I go and I listen through it and I pay attention to where my sound effects are. And I ask myself, did I think this sound was going to come here? Did I, did I like not trick myself? And if the answer is I didn't trick myself, I take that sound out because what you don't want to do is prime your audience to know when you're always going to use sound cues because that also kind of strips some of the magic uh, away from it. But uh, I'll let Kevin jump in here as well. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what you said. I think my, my sound engineer, uh, Adrian Parrish, he's I talked about before that the perfect, absolute perfect sound sometimes doesn't work in audio drama because it's supposed to be a world, right? You, you know, if it was, a, we're recording pop singers, then yeah, perfect sound. But people talking in a bar talks different than a sterile studio lab. So you do have some flexibility with the recording. I would try to make it as good as you can, you know, um, and if you don't have the equipment to get a good recording, maybe that's just part of the story, you know, and, and there's a reason there. So you have perhaps more flexibility than other outlets for audio. Um, our, we, did, we had three actors and the sound engineer in a room when we recorded. I liked having my, I have lots of act. Well, I had eight act, eight ish actors for the second season. Um, so we were all in a room. I like having my actors in a room together. Um, I did the math and it came down to about four pages of script an hour is what we did. Uh, we recorded from November to thank goodness February was when we stopped recording. So that worked out well. Um, and about four pages an hour, which I think is about right. Um, I know in film, you know, the rule of thumb is about five pages of script a day, a 15 hour day. So and there you go. We ended up doing blocks of only two hours, two to three hours of acting, of recording at a time um, for various reasons for logistics. But I ended up deciding I think that's what I would do. Uh, I've heard that voice actors in video game industry, their voices are they're getting they're doing physical damage to their voices because you're talking nonstop and you're you're talking up, you know, you're really energetic. So I, I think going forward, I, I'm not going to really ask my actors to do more than a, a three hour block of recording in a time. Um, and the other thing we did for that, I think is probably good advice is I went through and picked out what I felt and the actors did too. I have a lot of my, my actors all know they can contribute ideas. Um, what were the most important lines of dialogue? Where's the story really hinge on those lines of dialogue? And after we did a scene, we would do coverage where they would do that, uh, just that line of dialogue is angry, sad, happy, just really trying to extremely play it out. Um, and everybody's in, in totally in agreement that that was the good thing to do. So scenes that maybe needed a punch up, I've, I've got that pool of coverage to pull from. Um, and it doesn't add a lot of time to it. Um, so I guess I think when you do your recording, if you are using a lot of actors, um, think of like individual lines that would be good to have four or five takes of extremely different versions um, on that. 
like I said, my actors were all in a room. I know some folks, they have one actor in LA and one in New York and whatever. I haven't done that. Someone else would have to speak through the uh, logistics of how that works. So you mentioned time and we had a couple of questions about time and um, in the creation of it. So I'm gonna ask two at one time. So what do you guys think is an ideal length for an audio drama in podcast form? And the other question referenced something you said, Morgan, about listening um, to make sure it works. How often, the question is how often do you listen? How many times do you really listen back to hear it? Um, yeah, so listening as far, I'll, I'll go back and I'll listen to my show maybe twice um, before I go and I post it. Uh, because the problem is you're going to always find something that you want to fix. And at a certain point, you just got to let it go. And so <laughs> the number I gave myself is two. Um, and I allow myself to go back and listen to it twice. But I do my listen the next day or a few hours after my final mix because your ears get tired. You know, and so you might over adjust one of your sound effects and you'll be like, this is great. You upload and you'd be like, why is that bus so loud? It's because your ears were tired and they told you to make it too loud. So um, I'll, I'll tend to just listen twice um, and then I'll go back as I'm continuing the show, as I'm making sure everything still lines up plot wise and I can hear the things that I might want to change. And I just decide to tell myself um and i just let myself make that mistake i use my old episodes as a way to make my future episodes better as opposed to being so afraid to release it that i never get the chance to learn from anything so it's it's okay if you go back and you listen and you're like oh my gosh i can't believe i made that it's the most terrible thing no it's it's fine you made something it didn't exist before um so i, I would also say you know give yourself room to fail and give yourself room for it to suck um, because that's also how we kind of grow and, and get better at things. Um, and there was another part of your question. I thought, um, I think I missed that The one. ideal time mm -hmm. you think it goes into. Uh, so I made mine no more than about 20 minutes, but I made a podcast for young people. And so I'm thinking also of that younger age bracket, like how long can they really sit here and, and like pay attention to my show? So it tends to be between about 17 to 24 minutes long. Um, but I don't, I don't mind investing half an hour into something new if I think it's going to be worth it. The thing is your trailer and you can create a trailer, excuse me, for your audio that kind of teases your show. If it's good enough, people won't care about how long it is, but it is hard to get folks to invest in something that is like beyond half an hour, 45 minutes or longer, if they don't know you and trust your audio capacities yet or trust your storytelling. So the more you tell stories, uh, and the more you kind of get your work out there, the greater leeway your audience will give you when you want to make longer shows because then that trust will kind of be built in and they'll know they're not just being kind of taken for a ride. Uh, so for me, it's 20 minutes, um, I would say half an hour, um, but also as long as it needs to be for that episode to be complete, you know, for that, that arc of your episode to be complete. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think the the artistic side of us wants to say whatever your story deserves you know there's some out there that are two or three minutes long and is and some that are 45 or an hour so i think whatever suits your story uh that you're trying to tell is the artistic answer the money people will tell you 25 20 minutes because that's the average commute in america uh, so when you when the uh, the uh, the distribution arm takes over, um, that's what they'll tell you is twenty ish minutes, because again it's the average commute. Um, but don't feel like you have to do that, you know. And then I remember the second question, but not the first question. What was the first question? Uh, no, I forgot. So, yeah. I was saying, I think Morgan, Morgan um, probably covered it. So. He, he had a really good answer. Yeah, this is a good I'm going to ask you this because it piggybacks on what we were just talking about. Someone wants to know how much raw material, like do you record hours on hours to get to your, your time frame? Or by the time you get in studio ready to record, you know this is fitting in this time frame? Table reads, table reads, table reads, table reads. Same role as in film. More time on pre-production, the better day of shoot goes, or for us, day of recording. So table reads. Yeah, I mean, you only got, you're paying money for that microphone if you've got four people or it's tiring to record. So 
Um, we're not doing, we usually did two takes and then the coverage, like I said, the coverage really, really helped us dramatically. So um, yeah, I don't want to wear my vo my actors out. I will also say I got a, uh, in the chat, a private chat from Stephanie asking if she could post a link to her podcast. And as far as I'm concerned, that's fine. But if anybody wants to ask, ask CLT podcast person. So share away, share away. Um, so this leads me to my next question. So both of you seem like you approach your podcast different. Um, Morgan, you write, create, and produce your own. Um, Kevin, it looks like you work with a team to produce your own. So there's two questions that are coming up that I think is different for each of you, but this might be um, more for Kevin since you use engineers. Um, how do you go about finding your engineers? How are they getting into this work? And when you might have some in in answers because you come from a world of producing too, where is a good resource for people who wanted to get into engineering this? Where's a good place for them to go on the engineering side? And then the other question is on the actor side. So <laughs> producer side, talent side, you know where I sit. Um, so the talent side, the question is, if you know a good way for voice actors to get into this work as well. I got an answer, but more you want to do that? Um, yeah, so I would recommend if you happen to be on Twitter, checking the hashtag Audio Drama Sundays. Um, that's pretty much when the entire audio fiction community posts new audio fiction, posts, um, you know, ads looking for voice actors. I would also recommend that you check out the Bellow Collective. They are a group that does uh, reviews for podcasting, but they also have a newsletter where they'll let you know um, about auditions. Uh, and then Elena Fernandez Collins has Audio Dramatic, where they also post ads for voice actors. Um, they're a big booster on Twitter as well. Uh, and so those are pretty good places. Um, and then there's also the newsletter Pod News. Um, but that the hashtag Audio Drama Sundays, I, oh, that'll take you down the rabbit hole. You will find so many opportunities um, <laughs> to kind of test the waters in that way if you would like to. Yeah, I have an actor from my first, my first, our first season was a year and a half ago. So an actor from my first season, his name is Nick Shaner. He just, he had never done any voice acting. And I, was, how do you find actors? People I knew from improv or theater. I pulled from a Charlotte Storytellers group, a lot of my talent. It was just people who I liked. I like how they talk. Um, and Nick got into it, man. So he's just been doing it a lot ever since. He, and I've sent, many people his way so if you reach out to me i'll send you nick's information uh because he's found these websites where people are looking for voice actors for um audio books for audio dramas for a whole host of stuff um and i i'm sure if you googled i don't know voice acting meetup groups or something you'd find it and he he did that for about seven or eight months and, and they really got paid, but now he's, you know, charging. Um, I'll let him speak to how much and whatever, but that was two years of him getting better and better and better. Um, so uh, for that, I, I think there for the engineer side, how did I find my engineer? Well, he's just a very good friend of mine and um, luckily he's good at sound. He's studied it and he's good at it and he doesn't do it for his day job. So he wants to do it some more. So I was like, perfect. I've got an opportunity. We've done many, many projects together uh, and um, I'm kind of overdue on, on, on working on one of his projects because he's put a lot of work on mine. Um, so there you go. And I know, I think lesson might be there. Leverage your friends, see what your friends are into. And if they want to learn something, figure out a way to give them what they want and pull them in. Awesome. Um, we've got the chat box is lit. So I've got a few questions to throw at you guys uh, so we can get it all in there. So we know uh, what works best for you. And I will say, just side note, um, those of you who are looking for ways to get into other pieces of um, podcasting, remember this festival has a bunch. I was going to say a billion, but it's not a billion, but let's say it's a billion. Uh, <laughs> a billion sessions on different ways to come at this. And next week, there's a lot of stuff about the engineering side of podcasting. So make sure you check out the other sessions happening because they may have some deeper dives into those areas 
so we don't lose you. Um, so someone asked about silence. How much silence is too much silence in a podcast? And how do you use it to play into your stories? Kevin, you want to go first? I was going to say, Morgan, yeah, okay. I, mean, I was my answer is like, go to listen to Adrian and, and uh, Morgan on Tuesday, October 13th. Uh, but <laughs> there's silence is needed. Silence is needed. Go ahead, Morgan. Yeah, um, I I do I do like the um, the purpose of silence in audio because often you know I I'll use silence to let the weight of something kind of hit um, because what I actually have a tendency to do and I've been edited on this to the point where I'm like trying to catch myself is because I'm a quick speaker when I do my audio it sometimes is a clip ahead and so that means if I have something that is really resonating emotionally, I'll step on that emotional impact trying to get to the next word or, or editing too closely. So uh, silence can be used to kind of give weight and hold the space of something that may have just happened before in the audio. Um, silence can be a way to um, represent, you know, the internal world of a protagonist. I mean, silence can be used in any way you really want in your podcast. In, in mine, I tend to use silence when I want people to really be focused on the words. Um, but, you know, it, it truly depends. It truly depends on what you're writing about, um, the context of the writing. But, you know, often in my work, it, I use it to hold space. Um, I use it to kind of give people a minute to breathe with what they have just heard um, before moving to the next part. And that silence doesn't mean like sheer silence. It could be the silence of a sudden effect that you had is gone, but you have everything else still kind of moving underneath it. So um, you can play with the disappearing, I guess, of sound, the silence of sound um, in a, a lot of different ways. But I, I would say, don't be afraid of it. Um, and don't feel like you have to over sound design because if you mix the two correctly with your writing and some of the sound design that you have done, people will picture the rest of the stuff and they'll kind of hear it anyway without you telling them or actually having to kind of give them that sound. And I think on the recording, um, it's easier to edit if there's a silence between the first actors and with the second actor. We as humans tend to talk over each other. So if a lot of your actors, if they know it to it, they might be talking over each other a lot. And there's some sweet spot there of you want silence between the two lines of dialogue. So it gives you some versatility on editing, but you don't want it to get that in the way of the actors giving a real performance, like a true performance. So um, that's, a, that's something to think about, but I really don't know what the answer of where that sweet spot is. Oh, and right. just quickly speaking of like editing and silence, don't forget to get your room tone. <laughs> like whenever you are mixing, make sure you get your room tone, which is the tone of whatever room you were originally courting in, because you don't want to get home and be like, man, if I just had one more second of silence, I could really use this clip right here. And you don't have the silence. So whenever you go record somewhere, make sure you always get a minute of what's room tone, whether you're recording outside, whether you're recording in a studio. Um, and then speaking of silence one more time before we, we move on, um, I think Kevin alluded to this earlier, but it's, it's very important if you want your show to have the feel of listening to a movie that you have real sounds. Um, and that means you might have to make them yourself. You know, I've used the sound that is a doorknob turning and had people think it was a corkscrew, you know, because they know what you tell them the sound is supposed to be. Um, but pay attention to the space around sound because you'll notice if you hear sound effects from a studio, it kind of sounds tight. There's no air around it, which kind of takes away from the sense that you are outside, that you are moving about the world, that this could be real. So I, I would say don't be afraid of the hiss in audio, which is like natural sound, because we're never actually in true silence, you know, unless we happen to be deaf or hard of hearing. So if we are not within those categories, we're never in true silence, which means even in quiet places, there's sound. So I, I think it, it's more about the pauses, um, but I did want to just throw that out there. Good points. Um, I've got, um, I'm going to start grouping questions together, guys. So if I don't get your question, forgive me. Do not hold that against me in life. I'm also a <laughs> keeper. Um, I don't want any messages like, she didn't answer my question. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to try and get them all in, but you guys have a lot of questions. So I want to give Morgan and Kevin a chance to not only answer them, but 
elaborate on some things. Um, we have quite a few questions on actors versus voice actors. Um, where are you finding them? Do you recommend changing it, the difference? I'm gonna say side note, I'm not a podcaster. I will say there is not a big dramatic difference between an actor and a voice actor. A lot of actors do both. Um, in the world, that's just my plug. In the conversation. <laughs> but what, and is it different hiring a voice actor or an actor for your audio drama than a traditional audition where do you have more freedom because it is not as visual with who you're getting to cast in that role? Um, what does that feel like? What does that look like? Morgan, you said earlier that you're the only voice, but I, th I feel like I've heard some other folks. In it's there, just, so. no, that's just my voice. I have my, my boy, Jake Cherry. He, um, he's my engineer who goes through and masters it and makes it sound really clean. But I am the only voice uh, on my show uh, doing all the different voices. So you're going to have to take this one about. I guess uh, so. Voice yeah. Acting and whatnot, because I've, I've never had to hire anyone. I uh, hope one day I'll be able to. <laughs> I like working with people I like working with. So, you know, before I recruited him, this thing that I knew would take me a year it's I, I gotta like you as a human being so I've worked with them everybody before on something or another um one of our actors uh her name is Rashida uh Moore and she's extremely talented uh and she's a theater actor but she loves animation so she's just been kind of studying voice acting for years on her own and she's like like this she just went gr she did great so she plays like four different roles um and so uh, it's folks I knew, but we definitely talked about what uh, voice acting is. No surprise here. There's tons of YouTube videos on it, um, and you should watch some of those. If you do watch of them, what they'll usually say is don't get so focused on your accent or your weird little dialect you're going to do. You're, you're still acting. You're trying to give a heartfelt, a true, uh, you know, uh, from your soul so you're still acting um you know I, I thought we did a good job of not having to physically be moving around to to have good acting but we definitely thought about the words and and table reads really talked about characters motivations and pretty much everything you would normally do in i think theater or film to to get good acting you should do that um and the YouTube videos will basically tell you that, you know, uh, to to don't forget that you're still acting. Yeah. And I think that, and that's the point, I think that drives home. It is, you know, once you're acting, you're acting, whether anyone can see you or not, you're in it. And so the difference is you might have to remember mic etiquette and, and the spacing and the tone of it. But, you know, that's what you have producers for and the guys on the engineering side um, to make that magic happen and your directors. And All they're right. going to warm up to it just for a yeah. second there. Like, especially if they haven't done voice acting before. This season, what we did, y'all, don't tell anybody this. This is just between me, you, and the recording we're doing. We recorded first our fourth and fifth episode. Like Morgan said earlier, once we're on episode four, my audience is bought in. They're with me, right? So I intentionally recorded a later episode first so that all my actors who weren't with us the first season could warm up and figure it out. And we edited it and they listened to it and they kind of, you know, I'm a believer in if you're working with a team and you're doing multiple things, there's some value of everyone sees the final project, uh, a start to finish thing. So I think the first, your first recordings are not going to be great, especially if you're new to it. So Maybe don't do your pilot first. Don't do your first episode first if you can. Because um, your first episode, that's where people are deciding if they're going to stay with you or not. So maybe do a later episode first. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to flip to um, some market questions and where the genre is right now. So two questions in one, because I'm, I'm going to give space. Um, going back to Nick earlier, what changes have you guys seen in the last year in the world of audio drama? And what do you think will come up next year? And then the other question is, how do you feel like market demand is for audio dramas? So they kind of tie together. What do you think the market demand is right now versus a traditional podcast? Well, Morgan, you got a lot more uh, subscribers uh, <laughs> than I do. So you go I first would, on um, this one, sir. 
Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, audio dramas never really went away in the UK and um, other countries outside of the US. But I would say that the market for it now in the US, if we're, you know, strictly speaking by capitalist standards, is growing. Um, they are actively looking for audio fiction um, and they're looking for audio fiction um, outside of the context of the types of audio fiction we tend to get. So, you know, the uh, ideas that aren't all found footage audio, but like get make the audio you can make. So I, um, I have an agent who is um, at one of the major Hollywood uh, companies for doing things like podcasting, movie and TV because they see what podcasting can be and they're actually looking to try to start funneling podcasts into television and film because as you all may have noticed we are getting a lot of sequels and trilogies out of nowhere so they're kind of desperate for new content so um it's kind of a bit of a gold rush a bit in audio and i think that's going to continue for quite some time um in the u.s as people kind of start figuring out you know how large this market may actually be how invested do people are people willing to get into this audio and the different ways they can branch it out outside of audio um so yeah i i can see it continuing to grow but i can also see that it could lead to a lack of indie podcasts in the future. And so that consolidation under financial wealth could actually end up squashing a lot of the creativity that we see in audio dramas. So right now it's kind of up in the air, but the money is is very much uh, heavily flowing in into the audio drama sector here. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, there's a lot of podcasts out there, y'all might have noticed. Uh, so some folks are like, they want something new or something a little bit different. And audio drama is a little bit different, um, you know, because it's not, you know, it's because it's a play. Um, I definitely agree with the idea that it's a gold rush kind of time. Um, the last year, I went to the Austin Writers Conference, which is a film and television writers conference in Austin. In Austin. We were uh, lucky enough to get our, this season we're doing now, um, accepted in their second round just the script uh which they have like five more rounds so it wasn't that impressive but holy cow that thing is amazing i didn't realize how great it was and we did it because that's a rare film festival that has an audio drama sub camp and that's why adrian and i went and we got a lot of takeaways from from that experience one of which is kind of what morgan just said it's the gold rush and a lot of the folks who've been at it for two or three years who have do a very good job and have done well and have are able to do more than eight episodes a year, which is what we're doing. Um, they pretty much were all in some version of a TV deal, you know? Um, and what was said a lot and what stuck with me was whenever you have like the birth of a new art form, and I agree with Morgan, like, it's not really a new art form. It's a radio plays and has been around BBC forever. But whenever you have the birth of a new art form, whether it's television, film, radio, or a new kind of distribution system, like streaming or DVDs, that there's this hunger for content to fill that new um, outlet or the, that new creative outlet. And if you look at the history of, like, a new media there that's the time for outsiders to break in uh because there's this hunger for content and and that's what we're in right now right um audio dramas is tiny 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 little part of the podcast world uh but i see a lot of it room to grow if you do have aspirations to be a writer for television or something this is a i think it's time to do some audio dramas and get it out there to to get your stuff out there if that's your motivation you know um so there you go uh so this question has been asked and seconded in the chat so how do you know when your audio drama might be failing and when to pull the club and someone was like yes answer it so uh, <laughs> how, how do you luckily know morgan and i don't know the answer to that we have no idea how you know. know it's failing no <laughs> clue that's, you know, and it, you're going to be like, oh, that's a sucker answer. But it is it is truly, you know, only you can know when you are done. And it, it and failing depends on what you are measuring as your your, your success. Um, and so I think it depends on what you are measuring yourself against. 
um, and actually understanding, like, setting realistic expectations for yourself, you know? So, like, if you put out your first fiction podcast, understanding how vast the podcast atmosphere is, you shouldn't maybe beat yourself up if you only have 50 downloads that month. Like, you, it's, it's a traction thing. Podcasts grow bigger the longer they're kind of out there. So, you know, it depends on, you know, at the beginning, decide what your own metric of success will be so that when you get to that point, you can determine whether or not it's failed. Because a lot of people will tell you it's a failure if it doesn't have 50,000 downloads. That's absurd. You know, um, there are podcasts that take years to get that. There are some overnight that do. Um, but don't give up on your podcast or your thoughts or your ideas just because for whatever reason you were unable to attract a certain amount of numbers because this also has a way to do with how you move on social media and the connections that you have so you know as you make these podcasts and if you as you consider whether or not it's a failure you know just make sure you're weighing yourself realistically um against what's out there or maybe just weigh yourself against yourself you know be your own competition that kind of helps you keep from being like it's a failing because if you go into it giving yourself you know room to suck giving yourself room for it to fail you won't be so hurt if you're like, all right, I learned a lot about audio making that. Now I'm going to turn to my real dream or like just use it as a, a growth opportunity um, as, as opposed to like a failing, I, I guess I would want to say, because it's 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 audio, you know, it's at the end of the day for me, it's still art. Um, and I think that's, yeah, I don't know. So that's what I would say. Perfect. Yeah. At the end of our first season, we, uh, me and my friends found out, figured out a new art form and got it out in the world. And that was a success, you know, and we laughed and people I know would come like, Kevin, I'll listen to your, your audio drama, man. That's, that's, you know, that's pretty funny. And boom, that for me, that's good. That was the goal um, and figuring out how to do it. So that's me agreeing with Morgan that I think you have to create your own definition of what is success or not success. At what point are you able to monetize? I see that's kind of related. I'm sure there's another. Uh, there is. Uh, there is a there. On is there a yeah. session on that? There'll oh, I'm shocked session. to hear there's, that. There's huh. a few. Um, yeah. So I was going to tell you, there will be in the future. There's a few podcast marketing. We've got some on if you build it, they try it launching. So because we have now four minutes left, I am going to do quick rapid fire ending before I leave you guys with a few reminders. So fellas. Tell us in your closing thoughts, uh, number one, before we get to closing thoughts and I have to do a whole spiel, I'm going to say thank you guys for coming in and imparting us on your wisdom. Morgan, you don't know this now, but you're now my guru. You're up there with Oprah because I don't, I got a couple gems. So if I just, if I just email you sometimes and be like, hey, Morgan, can you spill a gem for me? It might come. I'm just saying I found a new guru. You said some great things about figuring out your yes and then you know knowing your metric of failure which are which are all like yes moments all right so in closing make sure you let us know fellas where we can find you on all the socials where we can find your podcast and someone had this question i wanted to save it till now because i thought it was a very interesting question for you what podcasts do you listen to what other audio dramas or other podcasts what's your top list uh, okay, so right now I am listening to Kalila Stormfire, Economical Magical Solutions um, by Lisette Alvarez. It's a really interesting uh, 21st century take on a modern witch, uh, and I've been really enjoying it. And you all can find me on Twitter at Optimus underscore Mo, like the Transformer, and at Flyest Fables. And you can also find the Flyest Fable podcast wherever, you know, you feel like listening to podcasts. Uh, I'm on episode four of Fly's Fables second season, which I think there's only four out so far this season. Um, uh, I like, which I really enjoyed it. Uh, I like comedies a lot. I like scri the scripted comedies, you know, because we're an audio drama. I, I'm trying to push this scripted comedy idea. Uh, two that I'm digging right now is um, Mission Rejected. It's just a screwball spy thing that's just a lot of fun. And then, oh, I had a, the other one in my head, and now I'm spacing out on it. Um, uh, it'll come to me in a second. Uh, we, the, the company, I put this in the chat, is Stationary Hobo Productions. If you just Google Stationary Hobo uh, or Stationary Hobo Productions, you'll find our website. And from there, it's there's all the medias and, you know, iTunes and Stitcher and 
Instagram or Twitter. So uh, I think the easiest way is to Google stationary hobo because the name Samuel Sift, everyone's like not sure how to what to what to. We didn't talk about marketing, but maybe come up with easier titles of your. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, like, what it also, one thing they talked about is make sure your title people know what it is from just the title, right? That that they got to instantly know what it is. And Flies Hey Fables does that. So good title, sir. Um, awesome. Nobody asked me, but one of my audio dramas that I'm listening to right now is Blood Ties. I really am enjoying that. I was a person who did not think, I listen to podcasts all the time, but mostly, you know, people just chatting but I got into blood ties a couple months ago and I'm in it. So the sword and the stoner, sorry to interrupt. That's yes, the you're one. like, I thought of one. Yeah. The sword and the stoner. It's this like Merlin thing with a shaggy, you know, uh, it's really, really quite funny. I love it. All right. So I've got one minute to wrap this up party people. Again, if I skipped your question, please don't be angry at me. I tried to catch as many as I could, but a lot of your questions are also going to be answered in other sessions. So if you have not looked through all the sessions or if you had something that came up today that maybe you didn't sign up for that session for previously, please go do that. Sign up, get in there, get all the information you can. Another reminder that this is recorded so you can go back and play all the gems and wisdom we learned right now. You'll be able to replay it and keep that for yourself. Um, the other thing I want to let you know is party doesn't stop tonight. We have podcast happy hours on Friday evenings. So register for that because that's just a time for us to sit back and chill and chat a little bit more. But we're in happy hour virtually. So grab your wine, grab your beer, grab your juice box. I don't know what you drink, but grab that and come join us for that. Please take in, share with your friends, let them know that this um, podcast is going on. If you are posting about it on your socials, just hashtag us at CLT Podcast Fest. Tag the presenters that you see tonight um, just so you remember them and come back to them and tell your friends about these cool people in the podcast world that you're finding out about this evening. Thank you again, gentlemen, for coming and sharing your wisdoms with us. We truly appreciate it on this third night of podcast life. Um, everyone else who came to join us. Thank you guys for taking time out of your Wednesday night and coming from all over the world, Mr. Worldwide. Sorry, I had to at least one time uh, let that out. Thank you guys for coming and joining us. We appreciate your time. Hope to see you in another session throughout the month.